Hey y'all, thank y'all for showing interest in the video. If you like it, please like and subscribe. Have a great rest of the day. Hey y'all, just uh, hope y'all are having a great day. We're just out here at the old stone house over there and all that stuff with Mason Lee here. And uh, we're gonna be doing a nice historical trek today and having some fun. Um, so anyways, I guess, what is historic trekking, Mason? Historic trekking is more or less a way to go a step further than just normal reenacting. You take your gear, you take your equipment that is of the time period and you actually use it. A lot of people that portray market hunters, or as some people call them long hunters, like to do this. But, you know, most people reenact and they'll take coolers, modern things, hide it. Here, everything is pretty correct. Don't see any coolers around here. No coolers, no nothing, so we're not cheating. We're going to go on the whole day, go on a nice long trek and stuff. Um, okay, well, we're heading into the woods now, and uh, we'll keep you, keep you updated. Whew, hiking along. Such a great hike. Yeah, that's not a whole plot right there. Okay. Whew. Definitely a long day of trekking. Yeah, this definitely is a fine place to make camp. Eh? Okay. Now, on these historical treks, you want to portray someone that is actually going out and doing their daily life as it would have been on the backcountry, or as a market hunter doing their job far into the cane lands of Kentucky. But you've got to carry your gear. You've got to have all the gear you need for however long you're going to be out there. There's three main ways that they would have done it. One, you've got a haversack. There's pros and cons to this. Pros, it's small, I can easily take it on or off, and I can get to it very easily as I need to. But, again, it's small can't carry a lot of gear. Second option is a knapsack. It's just like a modern day backpack. I throw it over my shoulder. I can carry more gear than I can with a haversack. I can even tie things on the bottom or the top as I need it. It's a bit more comfortable than a haversack. But in the end, it's limited and I can't reach things as quickly. Third option is a tump line. You have your bedroll or your oil cloth wrapped around all the gear you need and you have this wrapped through it so you can throw it over your shoulder over your chest over your forehead nice thing about this you can carry almost as many things as you need to but you just can't access them very far. so you can combine these as well you can carry a tump line and a haversack whatever you need to do and the nice thing about trekking is you learn what works for you and what works for each situation Scavenging for wood. Alright, so while you're on your trek, there might be a few things you want to carry with you. And of course, you have to look at your reenacting gear and decide what's actually useful and what you're just using as a prop. Something such as a lantern, that's more of a prop, more if you're in an environment where you're not going to move around a lot. But it doesn't mean you don't have light. As you've got fire, and you might also have candles with you. But on this blanket here, we have several different items. Some such items might be a bowl or a plate for you to eat out of. This isn't necessary if you have cooking utensils such as a pot, you can eat right out of if you're alone. You might have another pair of moccasins. This here keeps them dry if you're storing them in your stuff or if they wear out. Aside from that, 
you're going to have such things as sewing kit. This is what they would have carried back then, and this is what you might want to have in case your clothing gets a hole in it. You need a quick repair. If you're out there for a few days at a time, you can't really go with a broken piece of equipment. You might also want a bucket such as this, canvas or leather, that way to transport or hold water for a period of time as needed. You also definitely would want something such as straps or bits of leather. If you need a piece of rope or a piece of string, these come in handy. You can use them just as such, tie something up. Also, you know, here in the winter months, you might want a winter pair of moccasins, something lined with fur or have shoe packs inside. And aside from that, especially in the winter months, you're gonna want a second pair of clothing, at least if not for the day during night. If you're going to sweat up during the day, you need dry clothes for night. At least another shirt and a pair of stockings. And something they might have carried back then that you would possibly want is a journal or a book to read. Sometimes it gets a little lonely or boring out here. It needs something to pass the time. You'd also have your fire kit. You need that to have a fire. Fire is very important for morale and to cook will just keep warm. And also, you would have your food and spices. Food might be cornmeal, flour, corn, beans, dried meat, or even some perishables such as bread or cheese early on in your trip. But in order to cook these things, you would need something to cook them with, such as a pot or a frying pan. Or if you want to boil just a little bit of something like coffee, take a metal mug. This one's made out of copper. Something that many people that went out hunting for a living back then, they would like to drink tea, coffee, or even chocolate. Help boost morale, give them a little something sweet whenever they were on the trail. As I can tell you from experience, Eating dried meat and corn mush for a while gets old pretty quick. But you've also got maple sugar. This here is also something else you can use to sweeten up a little bit of drink. Use it in food if you need it. Just something to change your palate up a little bit. But again, you also have your blanket. You need something to keep warm during the night. And this here you can also wrap up around yourself if needed. Use it as a match coat. And you've got your shelter. Depending on what the weather calls for, you can set up something such as this oil cloth in many different ways, whether it's cold, rainy, or sunny. But these are just a few things that I carry in my kit that they would have used back then. You can change the kit up how you need it, use it, whatever suits you best. Okay, was there a particular time of year that they would normally go on tracks or whatever though? Or? Oh, absolutely. Uh, market hunters in particular were going out mainly for deer hides. This is a very big commodity, and hence the name for a dollar is a buck. But in the summertime is wherever the deer hides were red. That's what was favored by the colonists back then. So they would mainly go out for a couple months at a time to hunt for summer deer. Not to say that some people didn't trap during the winter. Trapping in the winter time is whenever you get the prime, nice long guard hairs on furs that would be used for colder weather. Just depends on what you're going for, but most of the time they tried to be smart about it and go out in the summer okay well uh what are generally the goals of going on a trek and and how did the fur trade affect where you went trekking so in the 18th century trekking was mostly done by people such as market hunters needing to feed people using the meat and clothing them or making utilities from the hides but people Long hunters weren't the only ones that did trekking. You also had people in the back country that needed to get from point A to point B to resupply while they're trying to head west to settle. But focusing on these market hunters here, if you were everywhere needed leather, leather was a very big thing in the 18th century. So the leather trade was very popular all over, but predominantly market hunters came from places such as Virginia, North Carolina, Tennessee. These people congregated and, and market hunters also weren't just one or two people going out. It was 
a company of maybe 20 or so men that would then break off into smaller camps from a main camp. But these people would go out into places such as Tennessee or Kentucky as more people moved into North Carolina and Virginia, game there became scarce, so they had to move west with the game. And after the death of the market hunter in the 1780s, roughly, is whenever the height of them faded, it then gave rise to some of these fur companies and mountain men of the Rockies that you hear about. But someone from down south isn't necessarily going to go up north to go trap near the Great Lakes region, unless they had other business up there. So what kind of skills uh, did a market hunter need to survive and be successful? So a lot of these skills would have been common knowledge for quite a few of them. A lot of them came from frontier settlements. But some of these skills would be how to fire a fire alarm, how to start a fire using flint and steel, how to cook food how to stay quiet in the woods to avoid being detected by game or Native Americans. Other things would be how to look up in the sky for uh, widow makers or how to set up a tarp correctly, how to stay warm. Certain things that you don't necessarily think about and take for granted nowadays, especially when camping with modern gear, you always have to constantly be thinking with these 18th century stuff because it's not gonna be waterproof. It's not gonna be as warm and it's definitely not as light. You need to know things such as first aid. You need to know direction, compass, how to read the sun, how to sharpen tools and maintain tools, other such items. So I noticed that you're going barefoot. Um, was that something that was typical of a market hunter? Um, did they wear any other type of footwear or or any different type of clothing or something similar maybe or so in the back country uh children would have gone barefoot quite often unless their family had the means or the money but someone such as a market hunter if they were successful at least once they had quite a bit of money they were fairly wealthy people if successful but barefoot is whenever it's wet out because moccasins are just a glorified way of going barefoot. If it's raining or dewy or damp, you've got wet moccasins, which are bad for your feet. But many market hunters didn't ditch their normal shoes before heading out west. Typically, they would have wore their normal buckle shoes. And even there's one account of one man having his shoes fall off and he reaches back to get them because the silver buckles on them were worth $6. So as these people are wealthy, they're going out with whatever they have on their feet. What changes is if their colonial shoes, say, wear out, then they might choose to create moccasins. So I noticed that you're uh, wearing a hunting frock and, and leggings and stuff. Um, and I've even seen a, well, I've, I've seen the a hunting shirt or, or hunting frock uh, being worn during reenactments, but the leggings, not so much. Um, mind elaborating on, elaborating on that a little bit okay. for the long hunter? So, hunting frock was kind of like the Carhartt jacket of the day. A lot of people had them. It protected your small clothes, such as shirt or even your waistcoat up underneath there. Kept them from getting dirty. As someone who is market hunting is gonna be out for a couple months and their clothes aren't gonna withstand it without something protecting them. So while this is a stereotypical market hunter dress or long hunter, if you will, this is not what they would have always worn. Some people would have worn nicer things such as a sleeved waistcoat or a nice great coat. It just depends on whatever they had and whatever they felt comfortable with using as their outermost layer. In terms of leggings, if you notice a lot of people stereotypically will use leather leggings. Leather is not a good clothing item unless it's just for briars as once it gets wet, it can dry out and crack. Plus it gets clammy and cold and wet not a very good item. These are made out of wool. They stay warm when wet. They deflect briars, I think, just as well. And wool was actually fairly common and even adopted by the Native Americans shortly after introduced to us. They made wool leggings just the same. So these market hunters adapted some Native American techniques, such as the breech clout, which if your pants get wore out, it's a lot easier to replace it with just a single rectangular cloth of wool than it is with 
a new set of breeches. And leggings, they work out really well with going through briar patches and keeping your shins covered. Okay, well question, how, uh, how were they able to make repairs to their equipment while they're on these tracks and stuff? So a lot of times, it would depend on what equipment you have, but something such as clothing, they would have a sewing kit with it. This there, they could sew up small patches and holes, have it all sew up leather things if needed, repair things such as that. Might not look pretty, but it would get the job done. Now, things such as your flintlock, a little bit more complicated. But a lot of these market hunters had enough sense and enough knowledge to be able to use different tools. This might be rings like that. You can screw things back in there, nap your flint. And they would also have things such as tallow they could cover with whenever it's raining out. And small repairs could be done, and some things on the firelock could be get d done without. So if the ramrod got broke, they could take another stick and shave it down. Or if something got broke, as long as it didn't have to do with the barrel, or the actual lock, they most likely could repair it. And even in some cases, they would bring along replacement parts for the lock, just in case it did break. They would also have sharpening stones for bladed edge weapons, and possible lard or oils to coat them, prevent them from rusting. So, question. So, uh, what did they have as far as food goes and stuff on these tracks and stuff? So, on these tracks, you're definitely going to want food that would stay good for a while. Uh, starting out, they might have more perishable items such as bread or something similar. But as the trick goes on, you're limited, especially in things such as meat. You might have things such as dry cured bacon, which stays good for a long while, or even such things as dried meat and jerky. That stays good. It can be made whenever you make a kill. If, as they killed animals such as deer, they would take strips of the meat and smoke it and dry it over their fire. Or whenever they made a fresh kill, they would actually have fresh meat. A delicacy is something they definitely wanted. But aside from meat, they had such staples as cornmeal. You can make corn mush or you can make corn bread, make different things out of it. You would also have things such as beans. Beans can be cooked up and fed to quite a few people. Just take a while. You also might have things such as corn. Just whole kernels of corn. And as you throw them into the fire and they heat up, you can actually pop them and they're like really crunchy popcorn just without the fluffiness around it. And you might also have a little bit of flour. Flour can be made into ash cakes. You pat them down and throw them in the fire, cook them up. They go good with corn mush or something to give it a little bit more texture. And aside from that, you might have spices. As these market hunters typically were wealthy whenever they were successful, they had many different spices they could use to flavor their food. And if nothing else, they would likely have a salt horn to go with it. On these tricks, food gets quite bland pretty fast. So right now, what are you making right now? Right now, we're making what they call ash cakes. This is where you take some sort of flour. You could even make it out of cornmeal, make a sort of cornbread out of it. But right now, we're just using flour, wheat flour. What you do is you, you add just enough water to make it into a paste. Once you've got a paste going there, you then just flatten it out and put it directly on the ashes of your fire. A little grit never hurt nobody. But adds a nice little touch to a meal. See that you're putting the ash cakes there on the fire there. Absolutely, right on the ashes. Let them cook nice and crispy. And we'll flip them after just a little bit. That does sound pretty good. And you could add salt, cayenne pepper, whatever spices you have on hand to these ash cakes if you want, or just eat them as plain. Personally, I like a little bit of cayenne pepper. So, right now we're cooking a meal that would have been made up on the trail. We've got fire cakes going and 
as a little snack or a side dish, you could take corn kernels and throw them right in your coals, sift them around, and they'll puff up, as you've got right here. So as you throw them in there, we'll just... If you're not paying attention, it'll almost happen and you won't even notice it. You just gotta stir them around with a fork or something similar, and pick them out as they puff up. So, what do we have in this wonderful bowl you have here? So this here might be a common trail meal that you have. You got here parched corn. It's cooked in the fire as a snack or just something to eat along with it. You got here ash cakes, just flour of some sort, water, mixed into a paste and cooked up. And you got dried meat. In this, in this case, it's turkey. Okay. Why don't you try a piece? Okay, I just might. Hey y'all, definitely uh, I definitely must say we had just got back from our uh, our little trek today. Um, definitely quite the experience. We uh, did all kinds of uh, exploring and stuff, and went for a pretty you know for a pretty good hike and all that stuff. Um, anyways, um, I definitely learned quite a bit. And one thing that I was definitely impressed with with you know and and interested to learn is that you know just how just how hard the you know the the hike was and you know the conditions and stuff you know like the shoes and you know moccasins or going barefoot and wearing you know and even wearing 18th century shoes if you can see them down there you know imagine walking long distances you know with all that and stuff i mean it's crazy you know and you know just the lifestyle of how it may have been you know and sorts but anyways definitely quite the process well anyways i hope you all enjoyed the video have a great rest of the day